Well, I think Lane's quarterbacks take on a personality from him, and they have a lot of moxie. They have a lot of uh, talent. They, uh, they, they play really hard. They play with reckless abandon for their body. Hello, welcome to Always College Football. Thank you for being here, man. This is awesome. We have a great, great week of college football. We got some big matchups to break down that I'm just so excited about. I am so looking forward to Penn State, Michigan. I am really fired up about Miami and Florida State. I'll be on the call for that one. Alabama heads to the Commonwealth to take on Kentucky. You got Tennessee and Missouri. You got Utah taking on Washington. There's a lot of games that we need to break down. So I'm so looking forward to today's show. I'm Greg McElroy. Thanks so much for being with us. If you could continue to like, rate, and subscribe to the podcast, it'd mean a lot to us. We so appreciate the following that we've generated this year, the numbers through the roof, and we so appreciate you guys telling your friends. It's a word of mouth operation. So if you could just continue to tell your friends, tell them we're breaking down the games, we're talking ball, we're getting in the weeds, and we're trying to figure out who's got an edge. That's the key when it comes to some of these matchups. So if you could, see to like, rate, and subscribe. Hit that thumbs up button on the ESPN YouTube channel. Subscribe to the ESPN College Football page. It helps us out immensely if you could do so. We're going to go through all the games that we referenced. We're already going to hit a couple games, give you a couple trends, a couple breakdowns against the spread. We're also going to give you giant killers, which we've done each of the last few weeks, and we fared pretty well. Called some upsets, have had a bunch of teams cover in those scenarios, so we'll hit those as well. So let's dive in. It's our favorite day of the week. It's the Thursday edition of Always College Football with some breakdowns. This weekend preview is brought to you by Dr. Pepper. It's not college football season without the delicious taste of an ice cold Dr. Pepper, the one fans deserve. Number three, Michigan. I almost, I keep wanting to say like number two. I don't know why. I apologize. I write the numbers down, but in my head, they're in a different spot. Thanks a lot, committee. Goodness. They played at number number 10, Penn State, Saturday, noon Eastern time on Fox. It's a matchup that I'm very much looking forward to. I remember watching this game in my hotel room last year. I think I was getting ready to call. I was in Gainesville. I know that. I think it was LSU, Florida. uh, Probably pretty sure that was it. Anyways, I'm sitting there. I'm watching Joel and Gus and those guys on the call. They're like, oh, this is going to be a great noon game, right? I can't wait. This is going to be awesome. My game's at night. I'll watch this whole game, then get ready and go to the stadium. And then it got sideways. So I was extremely disappointed in the outcome last year because I was anticipating a slugfest and just never materialized. It was the defense for Penn State that really let them down. They weren't gap sound. Michigan gashed them. They ran downhill 400 plus on the ground in that performance. So I think this Penn State defense is much better. More on them in just a minute because I think their defense will give them a chance. It's just about whether or not their offense can manufacture enough to knock off a team that's been playing at a ridiculously high level. Let's start with Drew Aller. He's been the guy that we've kind of centered around and him being the difference maker. He's got to find some opportunities to make plays downfield. He has not excelled in that area this year. He has, I think, progressed, especially in the last couple of weeks. More on that in a second. But I just haven't seen enough from him to feel super confident in them being able to manufacture huge plays. 6.7 air yards per attempt is 124th in the FBS. That's where Drew Aller is right now. And only 7% of his passes travel more than 20 yards downfield. That is 133rd in the FBS. He just doesn't try them. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that, that he has to against everyone else he's played. But against this group in particular, he's going to have to. He's going to have to take more chances because against Ohio State, it just wasn't good enough. They couldn't block him. They didn't do a great job separating on the perimeter, and they didn't manufacture enough downfield. He was 18-42 to for 191 and a touchdown and 64 of those yards. And Aller's touchdown came when the game had already at that point been decided. It was not a great performance, but it was his first opportunity to play at a level like this. So I am willing to absolutely forgive that performance because what I've witnessed since that time was him come back to earth a little bit and then rise back up. The following week, he throws an interception against Indiana. It led to the uh, Hoosiers kicking the game tying field goal. I think it was about like five minutes or so remaining. And then next thing you know, Drew Aller finds Keandre Lambert-Smith, 57-yard game-winning touchdown. He's been a completely different guy. It's almost like he needed to throw that interception, so he realized, hey, man, you know what? I'm human too. Let's go. And since then, since that 
interception. He has completed 27 of 36 for 308, five touchdowns since the interception. He's also coming off of his best performance. Now, it had been kind of a long time coming because he hadn't really found that consistent groove with his wide receiver core, and the wide receiver core has been, for the most part, disappointing. Uh, now, you're without Harrison Wallace, and they've had some missed assignments and some, and some missed meshes and some, and some overthrows and, and things like that. They just haven't re really been able to manufacture a whole lot against Indiana and Ohio State, but against Maryland, they were a completely different group. Dante Cephas started to step up. Keandre Lambert Smith started to step up. The tight ends, which have caught 12 touchdowns here this year, that's the best in college football, have been making plays. And Warren and Theo Johnson, I think, are going to continue to excel as Drew Aller gets a little more comfortable. And the offensive line really didn't give Aller any time against Ohio State, so I'm willing to forgive that performance in part because what was supposed to be the strength of the team, the offensive line, didn't do their part of the job. Now, Michigan, they're one of the best defenses in America, especially against the pass. They are giving up just 141 passing yards per game. That is number one in college football. And what's most remarkable about that is when you think about how Michigan's played and how they've dominated the first half of football games and they really weren't that competitive in the second half most of the time, you would think they'd probably accumulate more passing yardage against them. Why? Because teams are in desperation, throw it all over the yard mode, and it hasn't happened. There's not been a single team this year that's gone over 200 yards through the air. And Nebraska came closest to 199, but below the Mendoza line of 200. Rutgers had 180, and they've allowed just four touchdowns against the 12 interceptions that they've had so far. So I think when you look at Michigan, too, their structure defensively is interesting. They want to keep it in front of them. They want to force the ball underneath and then rally up and make a tackle. And in time, you will mess it up. You'll mess up the drive. I'd be curious to see, knowing that Aller excels on the underneath stuff, will they come up and maybe be a little bit more aggressive? Penn State's run game's got to take some of the pressure off, too. They have not done a great job on the perimeter, which I think is something that they should try in this game. Mike Yersich, when he was hired at Penn State, his expertise was the perimeter run game. That's why they wanted him. But so far, they're averaging just four and a half yards per carry outside the tackles. That's 115th in college football. And what I think is more alarming is that against a seven-man box, I was kind of diving in and watching some tape. Against a seven-man box, they're averaging three yards an attempt. That's 101st. Against an eight-man box, they're averaging two yards an attempt. That's 94th. So if Michigan decides, hey, we're going to sell out against the run and put eight guys in the box, it's highly likely, based on what Penn State's done up to this point, they're probably not going to be very successful. Two yards an attempt, 94th in college football. It'll be real curious to see exactly how Michigan structures their defense and if they sell out completely against the run and trust their guys on the perimeter to lock down a receiving group that's been a little bit up and down. When you look at Michigan's run game, that I think is going to be also very imperative. It was the difference in the game last year. They haven't been super elite on the ground so far. I was a little bit shocked when I looked at the numbers because it feels better than it is. Just 4.6 yards per carry so far this year, and it hasn't been against great competition either. That number is 47th in college football. So I think it's a few reasons why, though. You can be probably looking at a number of factors. One, they haven't really been riding the running backs the same way. Uh, and they've been able to really dominate their opponents without having to put a whole lot on their backs. And uh, another thing that's JJ McCarthy's development. I mean, JJ McCarthy's emergence has been ridiculous. And when you look at his performance most recently against Purdue, I mean, he's throwing the ball nearly 40 times. He's running the ball a whole bunch as well. He's the best player on the team. And that was not the case a year ago. Now, the weapons, I think, are going to be really interesting. It'll be interesting also to see how Penn State decides to match up because you got Donovan Edwards, the tight ends, which are a huge problem. I do think the, the perimeter skill for Penn State will match up okay with Roman Wilson and Cornelius Johnson, but the matchup nightmares, I think, are with the tight ends and with Donovan Edwards if he wants to get involved in the passing game. Now, Penn State's a good, stout defensive group. They had six sacks and 12 tackles for loss against Maryland. They are legit. And they can apply a lot of pressure. Will the uber-talented Penn State finally put to bed the narrative about James Franklin's record against top-tier competition? He's just 3-16 and 16 against top-10 teams. And more specifically, he's just 4-15 and 15 against Ohio State and Michigan. 82-22 and 22 against everybody else. And we know that the three wins against Michigan came before this 
things started to get rolling. A couple trends to take into account when evaluating the game. Penn State is 7-21 and against the spread against top five teams over the last 30 seasons. 7-21, and not good in performances like this in the past 30 years. Meanwhile, Michigan is 16-7-1 against the spread in Big Ten play over the past three seasons. It's the best cover percentage in the Big Ten over that span. I like Michigan to win the game. I like them to win the game rather comfortably. I don't think it's going to be in a landslide. I don't think it's going to be a completely dominant performance a la 2022, but I would be very surprised if Michigan doesn't win this game by seven or more. I think they'll handle their business. I know they haven't been tested, but this is an experienced group relative to their experiences last year and a lot of the guys that are returning off of a team that certainly came up short of expectations after they underperformed in the bowl game against TCU. I like Michigan to get the job done. The Ole Miss Rebels at number nine in college football taking on the number two Georgia Bulldogs. About a 10.5 point spread here. This will be Saturday, 7 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN. There are some rumblings now. There are some rumblings, and I love rumblings, but I, I don't know. If, if there's a whole lot to them, it might just be some gamesmanship, but let's dive in. I'll indulge. Why wouldn't I? Kirby Smart was asked on Wednesday if there's a chance that Brock Bowers could play in the game this weekend. Uh, that's 26 days after the tightrope procedure that he had done to his ankle. And here's what Kirby Smart said about him coming back. Quote, one of the first things you look at at this injury is acceleration and deceleration, not GPS speed. When you decel, when your D cell number and your acceleration numbers get closer to what your norm is, because we have a baseline for all these guys, then you can feel much more comfortable about it. You have to get to that point. Straight line speed is not football, unfortunately. Now, what I read into that is that he's probably not going to play. He's probably not going to play, but they didn't close the door. Meanwhile, we've it's all kind of dependent on the guy. I'm not a doctor, okay? I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I play golf with one. Norm Waldrop, who does the tightrope procedure at Andrews and is amazing. Um, great golfer, too, I might add. <laughs> He's like a plus two handicap, which is way too good to be an incredible doctor. But I digress. When you look at the tightrope procedure, it really is dependent on the guy. Uh, the offensive tackle for Georgia, Amarius Mims, also had a tightrope procedure and is yet to play. It's been seven weeks. Uh, meanwhile, Tua Tungavailoa played for Alabama 27 days after a tightrope surgery in the 20 after the 2018 SEC championship game. Then he played 20 days after the tightrope procedure on the other ankle in 2019. So Tua was able to return in four weeks or less. Meanwhile, Marius Mims has been seven weeks. So it's just dependent on the guy. And it'll be real curious to see if Bowers can go out there and do it. I know he's a freak of nature. I know he takes great care of his body. But to think that he's going to be available to me is probably a little bit optimistic. This could come down to third downs because it's the weakness when it comes to Ole Miss. Uh, they are great offensively. They can run the ball and has they've seen a resurgence with Quinshawn Judkins after a bit of a slow start. It wasn't great for him. He was banged up, had a rib, had all sorts of issues. And now the run game started to get going. Trey Harris has developed, obviously, as a legit go-to guy as a number one wide receiver. Jackson Dart looks much more comfortable this year. But they haven't been great on third down. They're converting just 36% of the time on third down. On the other side of the coin, Georgia is converting 55% of the time. They're the best, or the third best, excuse me, defense in the country on third down too, allowing opponents just to convert 25 or 26.6% of the time. So that could be a huge, huge aspect of this game. Ole Miss might be able to move it between the 20s. They might be able to extend some drives here and there, but will they be able to do so enough against one of the best third down defenses in America? Jackson Dart has not been elite on third down two. He has 19 first downs created, but he's only completing about 51% of his passes on third down. Meanwhile, Carson Beck, 65% of his passes and 29 first downs created. So third down is a big advantage in favor of Georgia in this game. Another thing that I'll be paying close attention to with Ole Miss and Georgia, negative plays. Ole Miss, they'll give up some sacks, all right? They'll give up some sacks. It's, it happens, okay? <laughs> Especially against Georgia. It definitely happens. They give up about two or so a game, two and change, if you will. They're 78th right now in the FBS as far as sacks allowed this season. They also rank 110th in tackles for loss allowed this season which is not good. That's about seven a game. And we know what George is all about. 
There's not a single team in college football that can get after you and pin their ears back with the same level of aggressiveness as Georgia can defensively. Now, they're not what they were in 22 and 21 on the defensive front. That's okay because they're pretty dang good still, but maybe not the standard they've set in recent years. Georgia's defense, there has not been a single team, though, that has had more than 370 yards of total offense against them. Uh, now, you look at what Ole Miss has done. Their kind of line for success is 400 yards. Anytime they're held under 400, it gets a little bit dicey. They go over 400, things are looking really good. They've had three moments this year where they've been under 400 yards of offense. They escaped against Tulane. I know it was a 17-point margin at the end, but if you watch it, it was a much, much closer closer game than that. They lost to Alabama by a couple touchdowns, and they barely beat Arkansas by seven points. So it's going to really be dependent on them getting beyond the 400-yard mark, and nobody's done that against Georgia so far this year. Another thing to consider, too, in this game, talked already about the negative plays, the sacks, playing behind the sticks. That could be a problem because the Rebels on the road are averaging eight penalties a game. Uh, even at home, when you take everything into account, there's seven penalties a game for an average of about 63 yards. So if they start jumping off sides, next thing you know, they get walked back and you're sitting at first and 15 as opposed to first and 10, you might have a productive first down play. You might have a productive second down play and still be sitting in third and seven, which means George is bringing in their speed and they're coming after you. You get behind the sticks on Georgia, you get off schedule against Georgia, it could get sideways pretty quickly if you're not about your business. So far, a couple trends this year. Ole Miss is 4-1 and one against the spread in their last five games as an underdog, and Georgia is 4-10-1 and one against the spread in their last 15 as a home favorite. I like Georgia to win the game, but I do think Ole Miss will battle. I think it's going to be a high-scoring affair. I think Georgia will get their points. I think Ole Miss will get their points. But ultimately, I think Georgia will be way too much for Ole Miss in the second half of this football game. I like them winning the game 38-28 right around there. So about right on the number, if I had to take it one side or the other, I'd probably take the points. Miami is traveling to Florida State. I'm looking forward to being on the call for this one. It's a couple touchdown spread. This will be Saturday, 3.30 Eastern time on ABC. A couple questions for Florida State. Are they healthy at wide receiver? That's a significant question because last week against Pitt, they were without Keon Coleman. They were without Johnny Wilson. They were out Deuce Span, and they were without Hakeem Williams. Now, they have plenty of other weapons to rely on. They are not an empty cabinet when those guys are unavailable. But when you think about Miami, it's going to be really important to get those guys back. Miami's pretty good on the perimeter. More on that in just a second. But they got to get their guys back, or at least one or two of those four. They were out and missed time last week. Jaheim Bell's been a revelation. He could potentially step up in the absence of the few. And Ja'Kai Douglas last week coming off a career-best performance. They're bailing out kind of the Seminoles wide receiver core with 115 yards or so, I think, just by himself. So they're very capable even in the absence of those guys. But man, they're a whole heck of a lot better with those guys on the field. Speaking of injuries, let's talk about Miami. Are they healthy at corner? That's a, that's a real question. There were two corners that left the game in Miami's loss to NC State. They lost Jaden Davis and they lost Daryl Porter. Now, Mario Cristobal said Jaden Davis is fine and the staff is for the most part optimistic about Daryl Porter being able to play. But if those guys can't go and you're now working with some other guys that are behind them, whether it's Devontae Brown, who's a veteran, Damari Brown, who's their brothers, by the way, who's younger but very talented, if they're thrust in the lineup and Keon Coleman is available, that could be advantage Seminoles in a pretty significant way. There is also a big kind of groundswell of support for Miami making a quarterback change. And I, I've watched the tape. I've watched it over and over and over again. I think since we've called Miami, we've called Miami's game against North Carolina, and then we called Miami's game this week. So I think I've probably seen every single snap that Miami's taken this year, every single one. And I've watched Tyler Van Dyke. And while the last few games have definitely left something to be desired as far as decision-making is concerned, I still think at this point, he gives them the best chance. Now, will they make a switch? Will they go with, with Emery, the, the hotshot freshman that made the start against Clemson and led them to a comeback victory against Clemson? Possibly, but I still think Van Dyke on the road in Tallahassee in a hostile environment gives you a better chance at the moment 
to potentially pull off the upset. The big thing about Van Dyke, though, he's got to stop turning the football over. Some of the turnovers are forgivable because if you look at the interception numbers, a lot of people will say, well, there's 10 in the last four games. That, that's accurate. That is 100% accurate. That is etched in stone. True. But two of those interceptions were on the final play from scrimmage in a desperation mode. The other was with four minutes left in a desperation mode. So three of the 10 were probably not... It's hard to apply those because the game was already decided at that point. One of the 10 was a really bad decision. This was against Georgia Tech. That was on a post. He made a similar decision on another post. He's done that twice. He's also tried to throw two hole shots in cover two where the corner's dropping back and the safety's over the top and the corner intercepts. He's done that twice. That's problematic. When you make the same mistake twice, that is troubling. If I were Florida State, I would run that cover two. I'd drop that corner. I'd play that safety over the top, and I'd see if I can't dare him into throwing another hole shot in there because my corner will fall off underneath it and intercept it. That's what I would do. But I would think that if Van Dyke is the guy, he's got to be smarter with the football. It's all good taking risks. It's all good taking chances. And when things are perfect, he's pretty dang good. But he can get confused in coverage, and Florida State does that an awful lot. Another thing to take into account, I know Jordan Travis, his numbers are not going to jump off the page the same way they would if you're Michael Penix or Shador Sanders. He's not going to have the same level of gaudiness to the stats. But if you actually watch him, especially last week, and I know Pitt's not great, but Pitt's okay on defense and they're pretty good in the secondary. But for him to go out there with that receiver core, as banged up as they were, to make some throws that he's made was pretty dang remarkable. He's playing at a ridiculously high level the last couple of weeks. And if he can continue that ascent, that would be really huge for Florida State, not just in this game, but as they continue to pursue a playoff spot and ultimately a national championship. I really think he has another level to his game. One issue with him for a long time, the deep balls weren't great. That was a big thing. It was just He was great running around, keeping his eyes downfield, great on the move, great on the underneath. But the deep balls were something that he wasn't exactly super consistent on. That's changed the last couple of weeks. He's hitting guys in stride. He's hitting guys in tight coverage down the field on low, low percentage throws, but he's pulling them off. It's been really, really impressive to watch. You watch this game too. Trey Benson's going to be a huge piece. Both teams are pretty good against the run. Both teams do a pretty good job, I think, affecting the opposing quarterback. I think both defenses are excellent. Both defenses have difference makers along the front. Jared Verse and Patrick Payton for Florida State, Reuben Bain, Branson Dean, and other Leonard Taylor, and others for Miami. These are really good defensive lines on both sides. So this will be a fascinating matchup in the game. And then one other part of this game I just want to mention for a moment. Miami might be one of the most improved offensive lines in the country. They're going to have to play that way this weekend. They're going to have to play that way in a big way this weekend. They've run the ball better. They've protected better. And they're going to have to be at their best against an excellent defensive front that can make the quarterback's life very uncomfortable, especially a quarterback that might be struggling seeing ghosts a little bit. They need to be really, really good in the run game and take some of the pressure off of Van Dyke or whoever is under center in this game. One trend to take into account in this game, Miami is 1-8 and eight against top five teams since the start of the 2007 season. Traeger is awesome. Let me tell you why. At the Home Depot, Saturdays are about two things. Making all your watch party favorites on the Traeger Ironwood XL Grill and Smoker and football. You can serve up wood-fired flavor every time with consistent cooking. And the intuitive touchscreen makes it easy to control the temperature, which stays steady. So you can keep your mind on the score, not on the temperature. And trust me, when your favorite team is on, that will come in clutch. Traeger is all about versatile cooking, so you can cook, grill, smoke, roast, or even bake, which means you can grill some burgers, smoke a pork butt, roast veggies, or even bake a pie. You heard it right. Desserts can be done on a Traeger. With Wi-Fi technology, you can be in the kitchen preparing some side dishes or on the couch watching the game while everything is cooking for your game day party by controlling your Traeger from anywhere with the easy-to-use app. And when you're done cooking everything for the game, cleanup is easy thanks to an easily accessible, easy clean grease and ash keg. So don't wait. Upgrade your Saturday with the Home Depot. How doers get more done. 
Number eight, Alabama traveling to the Commonwealth to take on the Kentucky Wildcats. It's be Saturday, 12 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN. Kentucky, let's start with them. Where has their run game gone? For seven games, the running game for Kentucky, led by Ray Davis, was about as good as there was, not just in the SEC, but in all of college football. Seven games entering the bye week, Ray Davis was averaging almost seven yards per carry. Demi Sumo Kongbe was averaging 9.6 yards per carry. Granted, didn't get as many touches, but that's a pretty ridiculous one-two punch as far as rush efficiencies are concerned. The last two games, however, it's come crashing down. It's crashing down in a big way. Now, playing against better competition defensively, especially against the run, so it's understandable that maybe you're going to come back to earth a little bit, but the drop-off this significantly is eye-opening. Kentucky against Tennessee averaged just three yards per carry. They totaled just 72 yards on the ground for the game and held Ray Davis to just 2.6 per clip. Not good. And then last week, you thought, well, maybe Tennessee is just excellent against the run. And they are. I think Tennessee's very good against the run. But it was compounded last week when they went to Starkville. They averaged under four yards a carry again, just 110 on the ground. Ray Davis, just 3.8 per carry. So they've been very, very solid, I think, up to this point. But they got to find something now as they move forward against stout competition. One thing Kentucky has done a pretty good job of is that they are pretty good on the perimeter. Their perimeter run games are very efficient, and I think that could be a spot where they might find a little bit of room against Alabama. Kentucky's passing game was abysmal. Uh, I'm just going to – it was not good. I mean, we called the game against Georgia. I've revisited and watched their tape since. I watched the Tennessee game, and I was like, that's not the same guy. I had to make sure that it was Devin Leary that started the game against the – Tennessee volunteers and it, and it was what I'm trying to figure out like why can't I just want to get that guy every time right if I get the guy I got against say Florida if I get the guy I got against Georgia then it's going to be really hard for Kentucky to be able to manufacture offense if you're that one dimensional and you're only running the football and your passing game can't take some of the pressure off it's going to be really tough especially in this league against quality competition once they get a lot of tape on you now, I got a ton of respect for Liam Cohen. I think he's a great offensive coordinator. But I need to have Devin Leary moving forward against Bama, against Louisville, against the teams they're going to face down the stretch in the bowl game, what have you. I need to have Devin Leary playing the way he did against Tennessee. He threw for 372 in that game. Threw passes and completed passes to eight different receivers. A couple touchdowns. Now, look at last week. The numbers aren't going to necessarily jump off the page. But there were a lot of really impressive throws that he executed against Mississippi State. Now, it's just 156 and a couple scores. Uh, he did leave the game in the fourth quarter. He sounds like he's good to go, though. It sounds like he's fine. But it will be very interesting. Can he be at his best? Because they absolutely have to have him at his best. Because against Georgia, it wasn't close. They need him to play at a high level. And if he doesn't, it could be a little bit dicey. The protection, however, has been pretty good this year. They've given up just, seven, just uh, 13 sacks. It's the second fewest in the SEC. Georgia's the only one that's given up less. They've given up nine. So the protection's been good. The run game's been good with the exception of the last two weeks. So if the offense can put forth their best performance, then that's where I think it could become a little bit more interesting. Kentucky's defense did not play well in the month of October. They gave up an average of 40 points per game in October. But they did settle in against Mississippi State. They held them just 218 yards and three points. So that's good. Last week was good. October in general, not so good. They've been kind of at the bottom half in, in total defense and pass defense, but they're sixth in scoring defense. So this is a group behind Brad White, the defensive coordinator, that will bend and not break. And against Alabama, it's going to be highly important that they give up field goals and not touchdowns like LSU did and some of the teams previously did. They've done, I think, a pretty good job, though, against the run. They're fourth against the run, giving up just 111 yards per game. And they have three defenders that can legitimately take over the game. Trevor Wallace is excellent at the second level. Deion Walker is legit. And then you have J.J. Weaver on the edge. They have three guys that are really good in the front seven that are going to be difficult to account for. For defense, they need to be really, really stout on the perimeter. 
that's, I think, going to be really important. They're really stout between the tackles. That's that's where Kentucky makes a living. Between the tackles, if you try to run it at them right downhill, you're going to struggle. That's That's where they are excellent. But on the perimeter, that's where there's some space. And Alabama, with what we saw last week from Jalen Milrow, looks like they're going to become more of a perimeter team in the run game, which I totally support. I think it's a great move. Acknowledging strength, acknowledging speed, acknowledging athleticism, and taking advantage of the opposing defenses with those things. I look at Milrow, too. It really, in the first handful of games against SEC competition, it was always about chuck the ball deep, chuck the ball deep, chuck the ball deep, right? It was... It was low percentage completions, but they were manufacturing big plays, which is a good recipe. It's a real good recipe. But I think against Kentucky, they're not going to give up those big plays as much. Where you make hay against Kentucky is on the intermediate throws. If you go back and you watch Carson Beck and you watch the Georgia tape, which is the worst performance by Kentucky's defense to date, you watch the Georgia tape, Carson Beck was constantly hitting those throws 15 to 20 yards downfield. He had them over and over and over again. And that's where you could find some holes in Kentucky's zone defense. Alabama's protection, too, has been a long topic of debate, right? We, we've talked about it on this show. The sack numbers are alarming, really alarming. But I actually dove a little bit deeper because I was just curious and had some extra time, so why wouldn't I? <laughs> I actually looked at how long Jalen Milrow's averaging before he throws the football. And this is in the weeds, right? But just bear with me. He's averaging 3.2 seconds per drop back before he throws the ball. That's the third longest in the FBS. So he'll hold it forever. Most guys are in the mid twos. National average is about two and a half in that vicinity. He's nearly three quarters of a second longer before he pulls the trigger. Which tells me the offensive line, even though they've given up a lot of sacks, they are giving them some time to survey the field. And they are giving them some time to allow routes to develop downfield. But I do think that's going to change. I think Jalen Milrow, after LSU, realizes, man, I could wait forever for things to come open, or I can just take off and probably make just as big a play with me carrying the football as me trying to drive it into a tight window. So it'll be interesting to see if he continues to progress with that development. He was amazing against LSU. He was amazing. And the run game, for the most part, for Alabama was amazing. 288, six touchdowns, all on the ground. Their longest passing plays last week were really just checkdowns. I mean, short throws, easy throws, high percentage throws. So I do think they might have hit another gear last week with what they might be able to accomplish offensively as they continue forward in the season. A couple trends to consider in this game. Alabama is 55-36-2. and two as a double-digit favorite against the spread in SEC play under Nick Saban. Kentucky has failed to cover in each of their last three games as an underdog. I think Alabama will win the game, but I do think they won't have the offensive dominance they had last week. I think that was as much, in some cases, about LSU's ineptitudes on that side as it is Alabama's dominance. I think they progressed nicely on that side, but I don't think we're going to see a 42-point performance. I'm expecting this game to be a little bit lower scoring. I think Kentucky's defense will play well. I think Alabama wins the game 28-17 or thereabouts in that vicinity. Moving on to the Utah Utes taking on the Washington Huskies. Michael Penix is a star, right? He's a star. We know that. He was amazing last week. He was on target for the most part. Did miss a couple deep shots to Roma Dunze and Giles Jackson. But, man, 22 of 30, 256, a couple touchdowns. Also had a rushing touchdown. You got to feel great about what he did last week. And you would think that he's probably going to be back to playing at a crazy high level down the stretch. The other thing about Washington in big games, and I would constitute this as a really big game, Dylan Johnson's been huge when they've needed him to be huge. He had a career-high 100 yards on October 14th against Oregon. And then last week against SC, they ran the ball as a team 42 times. And it paid off. <laughs> Obviously, Dylan going for 250, the offensive line doing a great job. That was significant. But more importantly, the run game is always going to be secondary for Washington. When you have weapons like that and you have a quarterback like that, the run game will be secondary. 
But what helps the passing game? The run game. And what helps passing game a lot, especially when you want to manufacture big plays? Play action. How about Penix off play action this year? He's 80 of 108, 74% completion with nine touchdowns, zero picks, and 12.6 yards per attempt. So if they can get the run game going just a little bit, stay patient enough in the run game, it could open up some play action, and that's when Penix will really bury you down the field. Now, Washington's going to have to protect because Utah's defense is legit. They can kill you, absolutely kill you with some of the pressure that they can provide. They added four sacks again last week. Jonah Ellis had a one and a half on the night. They're eighth in the country in sacks per game with nearly three and a half sacks per game. Now, if you look at Michael Penix, when he gets pressured, he becomes more human. Against pressure, he's 36-78. That's 46%, 8.2 yards per attempt. When he's not pressured, he's 189-246. That's 77%, and 10.5 yards per attempt. So his completion percentage, when pressured, drops 30 one percentage points. Utah, they have the edge rushers. We know that. Jonah Ellis and company, they have the edge rushers. But if you look at Washington, their tackles are excellent. So Utah's got to find a way to find pressure up the middle against the interior three of Washington. That's where they might be able to do the most damage. When you look at Washington on third down, they're one of the best offenses, but Utah is number one in the country on third down defense. They surrender 24% conversions. So Washington's going to need to stay out of third and long. And I think that's going to be really important. The other side of the coin is totally the opposite. Washington's terrible on third down. They're giving up 42%. That's 101st in college football. So can Utah kind of stay on schedule and make things a little bit difficult? Their offense, yeah, they're they're not great. They're not great right now on points per drive. It's it's not what you want. It's, man, you, it's kind of Maybe you soften the blow a little bit because they hung 55 last week on a totally beat up Arizona State team, but they're just so one dimensional. And that's something that I'm real concerned about. Now, Utah, 352 rushing yards last week. That's great. Uh, Jaquin and Jackson, even though he left the game, he had 111 yards before he left the game with the injury. It's eight and a half yards of carry last week. Bryson Barnes and Nate Johnson, they both had double digit carries, double, double digit rush yards. Uh, Barnes finished the game with 56 yards on seven carries. So he can clearly show that he's capable in the event in which he needs to take off and run. And Johnson, we know he's got track star speed, 79 yards on two carries, including that 59 yard touchdown run. The other thing I think for Utah is they got to be able to win some one-on-ones on the outside. Now Donna, uh, Devon Vele, he had a really impressive game and was targeted 10 times, clearly starting to become that go-to guy on the outside with Bryson Barnes, but he's going to have to play out of his mind in this one because they're going to have to match Washington point for point. That could be really difficult. You look at Washington's defense, they can't allow 500 yards and 42 points on a regular basis. I, I don't care how many points they score. I don't care how good they are. You can't let Caleb Williams' performances recreate themselves down the stretch. They're more talented than that. Now, the numbers might not reflect it because they're 94th in the country as far as yards per game allowed. So they got to be better. And the other thing, too, when you're going against Washington, Washington's a really sneaky physical team. They're not, they're not like soft. I know a lot of people will think, well, they throw it all over the yard. They must be soft. They're not soft. I can promise you that. But I don't know if they're as physical as Utah. Now, Kyle Weddingham's Utah teams are almost always amongst the most physical in the country, and this year is no different. Now, they were embarrassed a couple of weeks ago on a national stage by Oregon. And I would imagine that they really view this opportunity as a significant one because it could change the perception of not just their program, but kind of how they're viewed amongst the national media. Because I'm not sold on Utah at the moment. I'm going to be honest. I'm not sold on them at all. I think their offense is very, very, very inconsistent. So if they can get it going against Washington, that'll change my opinion. I think it'll change a lot of others' opinion as well. Utah is excellent as a road underdog over the last 10 years. They are 14-4 and four against the spread as a road dog. And they are 4-1 and one against the spread against teams with winning records this season. You might hear about Utah here in a little bit in our Giant Killers segment. You might hear about them. Just saying. Not teasing it, but you might say, I like Washington to win the game. But by how much, I might have to explain that one here in just a moment. Number 12, Tennessee, 13, Tennessee, whatever they are, on the road at Missouri. This will be Saturday, 3.30 Eastern time 
on CBS. Big question this one, which team can run the football? Uh, will Missouri be able to run the football? Will Tennessee be able to allow them to run the football? We'll find out. Missouri's offense pretty good, about a buck fifty on the ground a game. Pretty solid. And Cody Schrader, last week against Georgia, showed that, man, this guy's the real deal. He's rock solid, man. I mean, 22 carries against Georgia. You know how many times he lost yardage? Not once. Not one negative yardage carry for Cody Schrader last week. That's a testament to the offensive line. It's also a testament to him breaking a couple arm tackles and pushing beyond the sticks, regardless of the circumstances. Not one time he was tackled behind the line of scrimmage. That's ridiculously impressive. Well, Tennessee is one of the best in college football forcing negative plays. They allow just 97 yards per, uh, yards per game on the ground. So it's going to be very, very interesting to see whether or not Tennessee is up to the task. Uh, Missouri wants to push the ball down the field a little bit. They're not a team that's going to just take shots over and over and over again. But Tennessee's really good in kind of keeping the ball in front of them. For as aggressive as they are, they don't give up a lot of big plays, which I think is shocking. They're actually number two in college football right now, allowing just 6.3 yards per attempt. That's pretty significant when you take that into account. Now, Tennessee's run game has gotten after Missouri in the past. Now, I, I love Missouri's defense. I think they're very good. They're very, very good. But when I was watching them back the last few weeks, I do think they're a little bit susceptible on the downhill runs. And sure enough, I looked at some next-level stats. Missouri gives up 5.1 yards per carry between the tackles. You heard that right. 5.1 yards per carry between the tackles. That's 103rd in college football. You know what Tennessee does? They run it between the tackles. They give up 6.1 yards per carry. Right up the middle. That's seventh in the FBS. It's going to be very significant and could be a huge differentiator in the game. Now, Tennessee also has a propensity to create big plays via the run game. They're one of the best backs, collection of backs in the SEC. They have 72 explosive runs this year. That's runs that gain 10 or more yards. That's second. All right, they're legit. 21% of their carries go for 10 or more yards. Missouri's allowed just 44 carries of 10 plus this year. So can Missouri tackle these guys in the open field? That's going to be a significant question mark that needs to get answered quickly. Another part of Tennessee's development over the course of the season has been Joe Milton's growth. There was a lot of criticism centered around Milton's ability to improvise and create and play off schedule. But then you kind of find out that there was a stretch in September where he almost never ran. From September 9th to September 30th, he had just 25 total yards running the football. It's pretty wild. From the 9th to the 30th, just 25 yards rushing. Now, instead of escaping, he was kind of taking sacks or throwing some ill-advised passes or kind of running around and throwing it away. Well, Josh Heupel kind of let us know that he wasn't running around very much because he was hurt. There were some unreported injuries. But you look at the last two weeks against pretty good SEC competition against Alabama and Kentucky, both on the road. Milton's playing much better as far as his completion percentage is concerned. He's up to 74% the last two weeks for 499 and three touchdowns. He's also rushed for 85 yards in those two games. So that'll be significant as well. Missouri was dealt a tough blow. They lost Chad Bailey, their captain defensively for the rest of the year as well. So I'll be curious to see if Joe Milton's growth can continue on the road against a defense that I have a ton of respect for in Missouri. A couple trends in the game. Tennessee has covered each of the last four meetings with Missouri. Maybe it has something to do with the runs right between the tackles. I happen to think it does. Missouri is 7-13 and 13 against the spread when the line is between negative 3 and plus 3. Minus three and plus three, <laughs> negative three. Minus three and plus three over the past 10 seasons. I'm taking Tennessee in the game. I think they go on the road to Missouri. It won't be pretty, but they'll get the job done. I think Joe Milton's growth and willingness to run could be the difference. And what I alluded to earlier, I am concerned about Missouri being able to stop the run between the tackles because I know that will be a high priority for Josh Heupel and his offense. Mmm, you smell that? That's the scent of fresh turf and freshly cracked Dr. Pepper, which can only mean one thing. It's college football season. So block off your Saturdays and swipe a sweet Dr. Pepper from the mini fridge because there's a new season of high kicks, long throws, and Fansville commercial breaks to carry you all the way to the West Coast games. That's right. The fans are back. 
and this year things are heating up. We're talking about hot takes, more heartbreak, more layers of face paint. Get ready to drink in all the drama this season with the help of the most delicious college football tradition there is, Dr. Pepper, the one fans deserve. Michigan State traveling to Columbus. Saturday, 7.30 Eastern Time. Uh, this one will be on NBC. So looking forward to the great Todd Blackledge being on the call. Um, Michigan State's giving up about 350 yards per game and about 26 points per contest. This has to be a get-right spot for Kyle McCord and the Ohio State offense. It has to be. Absolute has to be. Now, I will say this. Michigan State's coming off a seven-sack performance. So that might be something to take note of. But, man, Michigan State, they've had a tough time defending – perimeter passing game for years, years and years and years and years and years, years and years. Even dating back to when I played my last game of college career against Michigan State. It's like, hey, how do we beat Michigan State? Well, beat them at the corners because they're going to play man and we're going to beat them in corners. They still do the same thing. So I still think it'll be very, very interesting to see how Michigan State covers Marvin Harrison. Will they be stubborn? Probably. So he should have 200 yards in the performance and Kyle McCord and the offense for Ohio State should get into a really nice rhythm and a really nice sync. Now, Ohio State has covered six consecutive games against Michigan State. Meanwhile, Michigan State is 2-9 and nine against spread against top 10 teams since the start of 2019. Give me the Buckeyes in a landslide this weekend. The Texas Longhorns are at TCU. This is Saturday, 7.30 Eastern time on ABC. All I want to see from Texas is clean football. That's it. Now, TCU has been a bit of a house of horrors. This is TCU Super Bowl. We've seen several examples in which TCU team, even years back in the Gary Patterson at the end of his era, they always fared pretty well against Texas. And last year, offensively, Texas was much maligned when they took on the Horned Frogs. All I want to see is clean football from them. Now, they've been able to win their two games with Quinn Ewers, but they definitely miss Quinn Ewers. And Malik Murphy, he's as many turnovers as Ewers did in the first seven starts of the season in just two games. So they need to just play clean football. And I just want to see them take care of the football, be smart with the football, value the football, and they'll be just fine. But either way, they should handle this one. They should be able to run the ball with a lot of efficiency. And TCU has struggled in their last five Big 12 games. They're one and four against the spread in their last five. Texas is four and eight against the spread in their last 12 games against TCU, though. So like I said, Texas played TCU a little closer than you would like. If Malik Murphy turns the ball over, this game will be close. If he doesn't and they play clean, they should win the game comfortably. Number six, Oregon will host the USC Trojans. This will be Saturday at 1030 Eastern time. Uh, you got to think we've already talked about Bo Nix earlier this week and, and how he's playing. He's amazing. The offense in general for Oregon is amazing. And they got to be licking their chops knowing that they're going to now welcome in a USC defense that has allowed 30-plus points in six straight games. It's the longest streak in school history. Dates all the way back to 2021. That's the longest streak ever. Well, they've matched it here in 2023. Bucky Irby and Jordan James are amazing. Now, I've said it for year, for weeks, not years. Uh, I've said it for a while now that I think Bucky Irving is their best player. Uh, I think he's that good. I think he's that dynamic. I think he's that unique. And Jordan James is very good as well. So not taking anything away from him, Bucky Irving is electric when he's on the field. I would think that the Ducks will run wild in this game. SC has given up 187 yards rushing a game and nearly five yards a carry. If they don't dominate the line of scrimmage in this one, I'd be shocked against a defense that's really reeling and given up a bunch of points and a bunch of yards to opposing backs already this year. Couple trends in this game. Oregon is five and one against the spread as a double digit favorite this year. USC is 0 and four against the spread on the road this year. And they're two and eight against the spread this season. The Trojans 200 cover percentage is the second worst in the FBS. I think Oregon wins this game running away. I think USC might score for a while in the first half, but Oregon in the second half, they put the pedal down. Bucky Irving, Jordan James go off and they light up the scoreboard against the Trojans. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. All right, guys, it's that time of year. It's that time of year, man, 
We have championship game clinching scenarios. I, I know. Coobs is like rolling his eyes. And, and he's not even on camera right now, but I know he's rolling his eyes because it's a Notre Dame guy. He does not acknowledge championship games. Fair enough. I do. I love conference championships, and I'm excited to see some of these matchups because they're starting to materialize. We got action. Let's start with the ACC. Florida State's already clinched their spot in the championship game. They'll be in Charlotte. But Louisville, they clinch a spot in the championship game with a win and a North Carolina loss. So Louisville could potentially punch their ticket to Charlotte this weekend if they can take care of business and the Tar Heels come up short. We had Louisville in the championship game Florida, playing Florida State. Just saying. Not, not many people did. Media picked them to finish eighth. We had them second to Florida State. Looking likely that the Cardinals will be in Charlotte. Looks Looking likely that always college football might actually get something correct. We also had Bama and Georgia in the SEC championship. Georgia will clinch the East with a win or a Tennessee loss. And Alabama will clinch the West with a win or an Ole Miss loss. So Alabama plays at noon. They won't know their fate until Ole Miss plays at 3.30. But Georgia... If they win and Tennessee loses to Missouri in the nightcap, they should be in pretty good shape. Uh, excuse me. No, Tennessee's at 3.30. Ole Miss is at night. I'm used to the CBS 3.30 game. I apologize. The Pac-12 Washington will clinch a spot in the championship game with a win and an Oregon State loss and an Arizona loss. So if Arizona for some reason loses or Oregon State for some reason loses, that means Washington will clinch a spot in the championship game. Keep it on Arizona, Colorado. Reference it already. If Arizona loses on the road to Colorado, that'll be interesting. But Colorado has been changing play callers. We didn't really talk about that last week. What are we doing? I mean, Sean Lewis, I know that they haven't run the ball with a lot of efficiency. I know that the protection issues have been a problem. But Sean Lewis is hardly the problem. The, the problem is that the offensive line personnel is not where it needs to be just yet. And that's it's to be expected when you flip the roster, continuity and offensive linemen weren't just flocking the boulder. And it was going to be a challenge. And I think Sean Lewis to have the play calling duty stripped from him is kind of crazy to me. But I digress. Arizona has been as hot as can be. have won three straight games against ranked competition. And they now are ranked in the top 25. They'll go on the road to Colorado where they're a pretty heavy favorite, about two touchdowns. Keep an eye on that one. Number 22, number 15. Oklahoma State. I don't know why all my numbers are all messed up, but I digress. Uh, Oklahoma State is at UCF in the bounce house. It'll be Saturday, 3.30 Eastern time on ESPN. Oklahoma State has kind of struggled at times with, with mobile quarterbacks this year, which means that John Rice Plumley might be able to get some things going. Now, Plumley hasn't really been healthy since week two, but he's still really mobile. So this one could be a little bit interesting, and I think it could be a little bit high scoring as well. Meanwhile, Ollie Gordon, he's the nation's leader in rushing yards so far, 1,224 rushing yards and 12 rushing touchdowns. He's probably en route to New York for the Heisman Trophy ceremony. Will he win it? I don't know, but he's been terrific. And Cincinnati last week, they're not good. They're not good right now, but they managed 248 yards on the ground against UCF. So I think Ollie Gordon might go for two bills in this one. Probably worth watching, that's for sure. Oklahoma State has covered five consecutive games, and each of UCF's last four home games have gone over the total. I think it'll be high scoring. I think Oklahoma State handles their business on the road. Florida is at LSU. Why is this not a featured game? It's crazy to, to think. This is always like, at least when I was playing or the last 15 years, has been one of the biggest games in the docket. It'll be Saturday, 7.30 Eastern time on SEC Network. Sometimes it feels like Billy Napier kind of abandons the run just a little bit too soon. It looks like with some, you know, there's some trouble or they get into a little bit of a rough patch offensively. They kind of abandon the run. I don't think they need to do that in this game, given the fact that LSU is giving up about five yards a carry. It's 118th in FBS. So I think Florida is going to hang in this game. I think it'll be high scoring. Uh, I think LSU's defense is a problem. There are some question marks as to whether or not Jaden Daniels will play. I would expect him to play. If he doesn't, it'll be Garrett Nussmeyer, who's a talented guy, but not nearly as mobile as Jaden Daniels. I think Florida will hang in this game. I think it'll be close. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more here in just a minute. Dating back to the 2021 season with Notre Dame, 
Brian Kelly led teams are 11 and 2 against the spread as a home favorite. He's 5 and 1 against the spread at Notre Dame and 6 and 1 against the spread at LSU as a home favorite and LSU has covered three consecutive games against Florida. I think it'll be a high scoring affair and I do think Florida will hang. So I think that streak that we just discussed with LSU and and Notre Dame and Brian Kelly, I, I really think that Florida is going to win this game and keep it within the number. Uh, I think they're going to hang. I don't know why. I'm probably taking crazy pills. I digress. Uh, Texas Tech will take on the Kansas Jayhawks. Kansas is looking pretty dang good. That line is three and a half right now. It's Saturday at 12 Eastern time. And you look at Kansas' rushing attack, man. They are really impressive. Devin Neal and Daniel Highshaw are legit at running back. And Jason Bean, he's got track star speed. There's a group that's averaging nearly six yards per carry on first down, which is sixth in the FBS. Think about it. On first down, they're averaging six yards per carry. It means if they just run the ball, they're looking at second and four most of the time. That's wild when you think about it. And Texas Tech has struggled a little bit against teams with winning records this season. They're 0-5 against the spread with te- against teams with winning records, and Kansas has covered four consecutive home games. I think Kansas handles their business. Texas, is des- Texas Tech is desperate, wanting to get to a bowl game, wanting to get to a position where that game against Texas at the very end is not going to determine whether or not they're playing in the postseason. So they almost have to have this one, but I think Kansas gets it done. They got too much speed. They have too many perimeters, too much perimeter skill, and their secondary is really good as well. So I like Kansas to handle their business for sure. Roby is awesome. And let me tell you why. At the Home Depot, Saturdays are about two things doing more projects with Ryobi and football. Listen, yard work's frustrating. You don't want to be out there baking in the sun all day. You want to get it done fast. You can sit back and relax and enjoy watching your favorite team. Well, with just a pull of the trigger, you can dominate yard debris and leaves with ease without the hassle of gas with Ryobi. And the 18 volt one plus battery platform means that you can go from yard work to DIY in just one click. So you get more projects done faster. But what if the only time you have to take care of the yard is during game time? Well, get this. The cordless blower is perfect for football season with patented whisper technology that will make sure your outdoor space is tidy and you can hear the game while you do it. How cool is that? So get ready for more game with Ryobi in the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Last but certainly not least, we will kick it off with the Giant Killers. Now, we only have three this week. I was trying to find four. I was trying to find five. A couple weeks ago, we did five, and we went four and one with a couple outright wins and a couple games that went down to the wire. So we really, really wanted to get to five. I just can't find them. I can't make these upsets happen. Okay, I can't. I'm not picking these upsets I'm just saying that these are the wins that I would be very, very cognizant of if I was the favorite. That's all I'm saying. If they went out right, then you could say we called them. We didn't, though. No, I'll admit we didn't. <laughs> we're just saying that if I were Oklahoma State, I'd be very careful against UCF. UCF can run the football. UCF has some explosiveness. And if it becomes a track meet, that could play into UCF hands. I think it's going to be a high-scoring game. and I think Oklahoma State will ultimately prevail. But it could be a little dicey, especially there in the third and fourth quarter. We saw what they did against Oklahoma a couple weeks ago. This is a dangerous team that you don't want to mess around with. Utah is on the road at Washington. Would feel better if this game was in Rice-Eccles. But I think Washington coming off the performance last weekend, a gutsy performance on the road, didn't get a lot of stops in the process. That defense might be reeling. And Utah, they can affect the opposing quarterback. Anytime you have a defense that can affect the opposing quarterback, it gets concerning. I know it didn't work against Oregon, but maybe it works with a little more success against Washington. Now they've seen the bright lights and there's maybe not as much pressure on them. Play freely and go up there and throw haymakers against a giant right now that's ranked in the top five. And then Florida is on the road at LSU. Uh, I think Florida can hang in this game. Everyone's writing them off, leaving them for dead. They have to have a win in the next three games to get to a bowl game. And I look at the games that are coming up. This might be their best chance. It really might be their best chance because the road trip to Missouri is looming. That's going to be tough. It might be cold. I don't know if they can get that one on the road, but I do think this one is possible. Even though it's in Death Valley, even though it's going to be against a team that can probably fill it up on the scoreboard, if Florida can match them point for point, this thing could get dicey because I still haven't seen LSU stop the run this year. If there's one thing Florida can do, their two running backs are dynamic and they can run the football. Thanks so much for being with us. 
It's so awesome to talk about some of these games on the Thursday leading up to what should be an excellent weekend of college football. Come back and visit us on Sunday. We'll have our Sunday recap. Monday, we'll break it down in its entirety, line by line, all the takeaways, takeaways that we have from the weekend. It's a great time to dive in as a college football fan. For all of us here at Always College Football, we continue to ask you to like, rate, and subscribe. Hit that thumbs up button on the ESPN YouTube page. Subscribe to the ESPN YouTube College Football channel. That'd be awesome as well. And for all of us here at Always College Football, from Mark, Jake, Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.